Hi, folks. I see we have some people. Who here knows about EFI? Woo! Good. I'm hoping people out here know more about it than I do. Um, this is not a lecture, it's a boff. I want discussion. Um, the reason that I've called, well, I've, I've set this session up is that I can see we really need to think about EFI and what Debian's going to do about it. I'm going to end up probably implementing a good chunk of it, so I don't want to be taking the blame for decisions that you lot don't agree with. <laughs> so if, if, you're all, if you're here, it's your fault. Okay? <laughs> So, again, I'll ask, who knows anything about EFI? I know <laughs> so, there's two parts to it. Um, we need to actually deal with installing and booting on EFI itself. That is not actually that hard. We already have, there's a load of how-tos and everything on making Debian do it. We don't actually do it yet on our installation media, but it's not that hard. Um, it's not trivial, it's just a matter of programming. We can deal with that. The more interesting part of this is this big, scary, secure boot thing that everyone's been reading and writing about in, in the last few months. Um, we have several options on how to do it. Um, I don't think there's, there are any good options, personally. Um, but I'm prepared to be convinced otherwise. There are two obvious ways that we could follow that other people have already followed. Uh, the Fedora people, as uh, ably described by Matthew Garrett, have gone with um, getting their kernels, their boot media, and everything signed so that it will work on PCs using Microsoft's um, secure boot and Microsoft's key. Um, Ubuntu have done something different, which I'm hoping Steve will tell us all about. <laughs> oh, you mean now? Yeah. <laughs> Brief overview. Sorry? Brief overview, please. If, Brief if, overview. If you can. Um, so, secure boot is is important to the Linux, Linux ecosystem in general on account of the fact that by the end of this year, we should expect new hardware to be coming out of all of the OEMs in the PC world, um, so x86 computers, that are shipping with the intent to run Windows 8. And Windows 8 certification requirements stipulate that um, Secure Boot must not only be implemented, but must be enabled by default. Um, on any machine coming uh, that, that, to pass the Windows 8 certification, which means that when Joe User buys a computer at Best Buy and preloaded with Windows 8 on it, and they try to install Debian with, by putting a CD in or a USB stick or whatever it might be, by default what they're going to see is they're going to get an access error. Um, and so this is important for us to figure out how we as a community are going to deal with this um, so that users can still continue to, to install uh, free software on, on machines that they've purchased and should have the right to do that on. Now, um, the Ubuntu approach in particular has been to do our, our level best to prevent the user from having to do anything to fiddle with their firmware settings in order to be able to boot, which means um, going along with the... the um, the secure boot key regime, which uh, Microsoft is putting in place. Microsoft has said they will be a CA um, for, for secure boot uh, for other vendors so that other operating systems can also boot on PCs. And, and so we're in the process of trying to get that uh, going so that when you drop an Ubuntu CD in a, a UEFI secure boot machine, it will work out of the box with no fiddling. Um, now, in particular, one of the things that, that differs between what, well, there are two main things that you may have heard differ between what Red Hat is in the process of doing and what um, Canonical uh, Ubuntu are in the process of doing. One is that um, Canonical has, uh, on the basis of the legal advice we've been given, made the determination that um, we're, we're not persuaded that it is safe to use GPLv3 
um, bootloaders um, in this signing chain for fear that um, one of the remedies that a court might order is that we would have to um, disclose our private keys. Um, now, there's been lots of discussion on LWN and elsewhere about whether this is actually uh, a concern. Um, however, we're going with the, the best legal advice we've been given at the moment, um, which is that this is a concern, and therefore um, we've opted to use a non-GPLv3 bootloader, um, and we're implementing menu support in FE Linux instead. Now, uh, the, the second difference is um, that whereas Red Hat Fedora are saying that they are going to do um, full signing of the kernel stack, which means that only signed modules can be loaded into your kernel, um, we are uh, presently avoiding going down that path because we don't believe it adds any additional security value and we are um, trying to avoid having to do that because it, it does make it a lot harder for a distribution to rev kernels. It makes it harder for, for instance, any sort of DKMS package um, to uh, work in a distribution where a any sort of package where users might be building their own modules or doing the final linking of their own modules. And it, that obviously is going to invalidate any, any sort of a binary signature on those, those kernel modules and therefore doesn't work with if, you, if you have a, a security model that requires all of the binaries to be signed by um, a key that the user doesn't control. So yeah. I think okay. that's... Please, before you switch to another topic, what you said about the GPL3 license is not the view about the FSF, which is also, also the upstream for Grub, I believe. I, I'm sorry, I, I have a hard time understanding through Can the Can you mic. move the microphone away from your mouth a little bit? Yeah, okay. Oh. So you said that uh, because Grub is shipped with GPLV3, right? Then we would have to give away our private key. Potentially. In certain... Okay, first, first it's not the view of... FSF, which I believe is upstream for Grub, and they said that anyway, if that was the case, then you have the possibility to discuss with them to eventually change the license. That's what I read on their website. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of the FSF's public position on this, um, and I'm not going to comment any further on that in this session. Why? Yes. Basically, Canonical's best legal advice is that they cannot, they cannot safely do GPL v3. That's the legal advice they've had, and it's what they're going with. The FSF may not necessarily get, get to choose about this if things end up in court. You know, that, yeah, that's fine. So, yes? <laughs> sure. Do we have right? And so that's what Fedora. That's what Ubuntu have done. Fedora have gone with a totally signed chain. Um, what should we do in Debian? So I will say um, just that I. I uh, the reason this is a concern for Canonical. Um, tends to relate to, to issues that are rather particular to Canonical themselves in that Canonical does have a business around pre-installation of Ubuntu um, on machines that ship from the OEM that way. Um, I, I don't think even if everybody agreed with this current, th this legal interpretation of the GPL v3, which it's clear that not everybody does, uh, I don't know that that would have actually changed anything about the decision Fedora made and I don't necessarily think that should uh, affect what Debian decides to do here because Realistically, um, pre-installed Debian systems shipped by an OEM are not not a real scenario today. Sure. Sorry if I may just ask a perhaps basic question that's already been answered. Uh, how much of EFI is currently set in stone with regards to its API? Um, is there any possible uh, possibility of revision for the ability to, uh, in an automated fashion, add additional keys or disabling uh, on initial boots or white write once areas of memory so that on initial install the very first time on hardware you could write a set of key or anything like that. So I'm not familiar at all specifically with the, uh, the standard itself, but I'm wondering. Okay. So I mean, a lot of that comes down not to the standard, but, but to uh, Microsoft's certification requirements, which are going yeah. to govern what actually gets shipped as default settings in secure boot. 
And no, when you talk about uh, it, some process for initial key loading and whatnot, um, at that point, you know, what, what does that look like? It, it, are you running code automatically from some external media, and then doesn't that undermine, to a certain degree, what Secure Boot is trying to accomplish if you don't have to get into the machine and configure something in the firmware first? Um, we expect these machines to come from the OEMs with Secure Boot enabled, as Microsoft requires. Um, Microsoft's certification requirements do stipulate that it must be possible to disable Secure Boot and run without Secure Boot, but of course the user has to be able to get into the firmware, what would have been called the BIOS but isn't actually a BIOS anymore, um, get into the firmware configuration and uh, make changes there. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a usability obstacle for the typical sure. user. Th there's also a requirement that user must be able to install their own keys. Ooh, a bit of howl. Um, users must be able to install their own keys, but, but ex ex exactly how you're going to do that on an EFI system is going to potentially is going to vary hugely from one system to the next. It all depends on how the vendors have implemented things. EFI itself is, dare I say it, quite well specified. There are it's thousands of pages of documentation about how to do things, what what to do, you know. I, People reading Matthew's blog will, will feel the pain of actually trying to, trying to work out how to make things work rather than what the spec says. But there is actually a decent clear spec. The secure boot stuff is much less obvious. Um, and again, this is one of the problems. So this is where we got the, the, the situation where different distros are already looking at different options and you know, different ways of providing secure booting systems um, is that we don't know exactly what uh, the consequences are going to be if, um, if Microsoft disagree with how various people have implemented their own secure boot. You know, it, this is where we get the, you know, it, the choice of signing kernel and modules or not, for example. Right. So actually, my, my best understanding of Microsoft's requirements, in fact, does not say that they must support adding user-provided user keys. I, I mean, it's part okay. of the secure boot spec. But I don't think that's something that's part of the Microsoft's, the Windows 8 certification. It is likely that, o, that, that the ODMs and the, bio, the, the firmware manufacturers are going to try to implement that as best they can. But it does mean you don't have the, the necessary technical pressure to ensure they get it right is one of the problems there. Sure. sure. Um, I, 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 I know you said you weren't going to discuss it. And that's fine. You don't need to. But I still kind of want to say my piece. And so the point being, uh, first of all, Canonical can do whatever it wants. I actually, I run Ubuntu once, but mostly I run Debian now. Uh, but when they say that the court might force somebody, in general, anyone, some of your developers, to, sign, uh, to, to hand over keys, I have a big issue with that. And I'd like to understand the specific legal reasoning. Uh, because otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, it's fun. Not from you, but still. And the other point being that a court can order me to, or anybody here or there, to hand over a key. Would you? Because personally speaking, what I would say to a court ordering me to do that is, you cannot order me to hand over a part of my identity. You can rave, you can throw me in jail, you can do whatever the fuck you want, but still. Corporations don't tend to take the same view on um, <laughs> questions of um, civil disobedience of courts. Um, the, the legal advice that we've received is from some top-notch lawyers in the field. Um, there are still some questions that we're trying to wrestle with internally about, about exactly why we've reached this conclusion that seems to be at odds with the FSF's public position. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's not something I would call a, a case of FUD. Um, all the people involved do have good intentions. Um, I'll vouch for their, their um, trustworthiness. Um, and um, there was another point I was going to make there, and I've forgotten it. Um, so I won't. Dom? Sorry, just a, a quick additional question. So is there any chance of the uh, implementation that Microsoft has of Secure Boot being revised or adjusted on the basis of public pressure? I mean, is this something that we're going to have to, from your perspective anyway, going to have to work around now, or should we be beating down the door and applying direct pressure via OEMs and server manufacturers, or et cetera? 
if you know how to apply pressure to an OEM and get them to do what you want, please tell me your secret. Yeah, please do it. So, so but as far as you guys know, it, there's, it, it seems to be set from Microsoft. So, um, when you or? talk about implementation of Secure Boot, first of all, Microsoft themselves are not an implementer of Secure Boot. Um, they, right, but they have a certification process that they've said yes. that this, these are the specific bits of Secure Boot that yes. must have in order to have yeah. the Windows right. logo. And it's, it's unlikely that we will get universal coverage if we try to you know, go out to the OEMs individually and say, hey, this is also important and you should do this on all of your systems. Um, I don't know what kind of a success rate we can expect there, but I don't think we're going to hit 100%. The only way to, to get all the OEMs to do the right thing is to have Microsoft as the the, you know, the company with the purse strings in this particular arrangement to tell them that this is what they have to do. Um, and uh, I, in fact, so there is a UEFI plug fest the week after this in, in Redmond, and I'm, I'm going to be heading up there and talking with some folks, you know, face-to-face, -face technical uh, level about what our concerns are and whatnot. So um, I'm hoping to, to be able to talk with them about, you know, both Canonical's concerns for Ubuntu, as well as the Debian community's concerns, and and you know, lay it out for them what what we think is the correct solution. Um, but this is obviously no guarantee that Microsoft will change anything. Um, we, we've already got it, it's reasonably clear to me anyway that the the pressure and the bad press Microsoft received when they first started talking about Secure Boot and about how, how it it was going to be locked down totally, actually caused changes, or at least clarifications on what they wanted their OEMs to do. Um, so, of course, on x86, um, they are the monopoly operating system provider, so th they feel a lot more pressure to actually do what the press basically demand of them, is what it boils down to. Yeah. Of course, we still have the problem that on ARM, they're very much looking the other way. You know, they're not the monopoly provider on ARM, so they can do whatever random crap they want. So the other thing with respect to the plug fest, I don't know how many people in here actually know what a plug fest is. They're, they're actually, um, the idea of a plug fest is something that uh, um, Microsoft and Intel and IBM and companies like that have, have done for a while now, which is basically everybody who is implementing to a standard of any sort, they bring their toys to the building and test interoperability on them. So that's actually the chief purpose of the PlugFest, is to get people um, testing interoperability. And so that, if anything, is actually one of the better strategies of, of uh, getting OEMs and, and, and firmware manufacturers to fix their bugs, is to actually be able to show them there are bugs. So that's actually uh, even, that's a large part of why I'm going there as well, is, is I will be poking at them with the Ubuntu secure boot and see what happens. Okay, Jimmy. That's very cool. Um, so two separate things from each other. First thing is I just, I, I do not work for Canonical. I have not heard their advice. And I just want to encourage people to stop trying to pressure uh, th th that discussion to happen now, both because this is a recorded and public session, but also because legal advice in general um, needs to typically stay confidential to the recipient. And uh, otherwise, there's lots of complications that happen. Um, uh, on a separate matter, um, I believe the requirement to allow Secure Boot to be disabled um, is for x86 and AMD64 only. It does not apply to ARM. So, Correct. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not blaming ARM for this. This is a Microsoft thing. But um, I don't know whether Windows 8 certified, or I guess Windows RT certified uh, ARM devices are going to become popular or not. But whether or not whatever Canonical does, Debian currently supports ARM. So what are we thinking in that regard for any ARM devices that may ship with this situation? Okay, anybody else queuing up on the mic? Sorry. So what about the um, large um, enterprise um, purchases of, um, of PC hardware? Um, I mean, there are a lot of big organizations now that have thousands and thousands of, of Linux servers. How do they feel? I mean, are they satisfied with the solutions from vendors like, like Red Hat. I mean, I've worked in organizations where they've had over 50% of the machines running Linux, and, and this is going to be a challenge for them. And, and I mean, how are they going to respond to this? 
It's, that's a good question. Some of the OEMs are, you know, some, sorry, some of the larger customers are going to be big enough to be able to get, um, you know, custom built PCs that have certain configurations, obviously. But it's then seen against the, the greater market. Even the biggest customers may not be able to get to, to swing things with, with, their, uh, with their suppliers. Um, so this is exactly why, from talking to Matthew, this is exactly why Red Hat are, are going down the secure boot thing and going for the signed kernel and modules and everything. Oh, B Dale is shaking his head at me. Should we pass the mic forward? Just one, one other thing. And what about um, um, government buyers? I mean, uh, are foreign governments, like non US buyers of, of PC hardware, going to be comfortable with um, something that's cryptographically controlled by a foreign corporation? I mean, is there any concern um, from any particular country that has it? Again, good question. I mean, of course, at the moment, people happily believe in you know CAs from all over the world, and we know how just how secure the CAs are. <laughs> we pass the microphone forward to Bedell. There's a lot of different things being talked about here, and you have to be careful not to conflate too many issues all into one discussion. Um, first of all, there are customers in the world who are really, really concerned about um, zero-day BIOS-oriented virus attacks, and that's the real reason that the UEFI community has built the secure boot spec, is this is one of their you know, best approaches for how to try and address that. And the customers who care about that include people like government agencies who really want to be able to know for sure uh, what the bits are that were booted on the machines that they're operating. So, you know, for every one of these things that you bring up, there's sort of two sides to the, the issue. On one side, there's the people who really, really want to make sure that they understand what bits are being booted on their machine and that they're not being somehow um, damaged by, <clears throat> um, you know, malware that's affected the BIOS. But then on the other side, there's always going to be somebody who says, well, I don't trust anybody else to make the decision on what the bits running on my machine ought to be. So the position that, you know, my company's trying to take is one of, we want end users to be able to run the bits they want to run, but when those users are telling us that it's important to them to be able to know that the bits they want to run are the ones that are actually booting, mechanisms like this might be part of providing those sorts of assurances. So it isn't so much about trying to have control over what bits run on the machine in the sense of the company tells the user what they can or can't run. It's more about if the user says, I want to boot Windows 8, it should be Windows 8 and not a molested copy. If they want to boot Debian, it ought to be Debian. If they want to boot Ubuntu, it ought to be Ubuntu, and so forth. And where it gets challenging <coughs> is that the technical mechanisms for implementing these assurances end up sort of you know, coming down to who has the ability to sign what when and how does that chain of authority work and who can revoke what certificates under what circumstances. And those are all you know, really messy, ugly details. But you know, be careful about assuming, first of all, that not everybody wants this, because there are a lot of people who think this is really, really important, including people who want to run Linux. And in the other direction, you know, don't assume that somehow, you know, Microsoft is the root of all evil in this case, because there's a lot of different motivations coming together to cause people to develop this technology. And, and whether you like it or not, <coughs> Um, at the end of the day, um, it's going to be there, and we have to somehow figure out how to deal with it. I also, the folks that, that I work with at the company remind me all the time that you need to maintain a mental distinction between Windows 8 and Windows RT. Mm -hmm. And you need to think about sort of um, that distinction when you're thinking about sort of where the switch is supposed to always exist and where the enable disable switch is not allowed to exist by the Windows 8 logo requirements. Okay. Can I have a go as I got the mic? Um, yeah, to, to answer Don's question about public pressure, I think the, 
the ARM x86 distinction is really important and somewhat underplayed. Um, in a few years' time, the, you know, half your boxes might be ARM boxes, and if you can't install anything apart from Windows on them, that's going to be a really big deal. Mm. And, you know, as Steve said, public pressure made them change the x86 rules. There's a small chance public pressure might make them change the ARM rules. But, um, probably not, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that would be the thing to argue if you wanted to argue rather than yeah. worry about the technicalities. Well, it's a combination of public pressure and fear of monopoly litigation again. So... I think the sort of gazillion dollar question here is even if you believe that some huge majority of the devices in the world are going to be running ARM, what makes you think that they're going to be shipping with Windows on them? Mm. Uh, yeah, hopefully it won't be very popular, but um, uh, it's because of the network effect, uh, Windows is popular for the reasons Windows is popular, and most people couldn't care less what architecture they're systems running, I mean, that's the point. It's just another computer. Mm. Uh, most of your users can't tell what CPU is inside. They don't care. Um, and that's the reason yeah. why the technical excuse that they don't have a majority in ARM uh, isn't really valid. They mm -hmm. have a powerful network effect, and it applies to any computer people ship. Sure. So we've had a lot of discussion about, well, do we like Secure Boot? What are the things around it? I'd like to actually focus more on what we in Debian are going to do about it. That is the real point of it. As I said when I, when I introduced this, um, I'm going to end up doing some of the work on this, and I would like some kind of mandate before I get you know, castigated after the fact for being some fr freedom-hating you know, Microsoft employee or something. <laughs> so one question is, is it possible to have another... Um, ha what are the limitations on extra keys we can put on? Can we say to manufacturers, please put our Debian key on? Is it, you know, is it useful to make a Debian key and try and get people to already have it? Uh, I'm not sure if Bedell actually wanted to field that because he, he seemed to be. Uh, <laughs> I mean, because uh, yes, we could ask manufacturers that, but I don't expect most of them to give Debian the time of day as for, when we're talking about. A, a scarce resource like NVRAM on a board that they're making with very small margins, I don't imagine that manufacturers are, are going to be interested in having... What, one of the real serious constraints is how much space there is in the firmware to hold a whole pile of keys. And so from the beginning, the folks planning to implement this stuff have assumed that the right answer is a small, very small number of sort of root keys. And yeah. so I, I don't think it's reasonable for us to try and operate in a mode where we have to have unique key material in every OEM's machine. That, that doesn't seem like a good approach. That, that leads to this whole sort of question of who do you trust to sign what when and, and do you have the right terms in the contract under which they're signing things for you to ensure that it doesn't get revoked at weird times and all that. But, I mean, a limitation of what's been done so far is that any given binary can only be signed by one key using the secure boot setup, which is a major limitation for us. Um, probably deliberate, it's difficult to tell. Um, so of course, it won't be possible to have your own key sign the bootloader and still have it functional as a, as a Microsoft signed bootloader. Um, that makes it difficult. There's been discussion about trying to find some um, impartial third party, Linux Foundation or somebody similar, basically sign a, a generic Linux bootloader that we can then all chain from. Um, I don't know if, if there's much traction along that route yet or whether or not we can find someone who is big enough to go around and talk to all, all the OEMs and get their key included and also trusted enough and I suppose prepared to stand up and be counted and, and do, do all that work for us. Um, it's a difficult thing in the community. So of course, I think that's one of the reasons, one of the things that as far as I can see why uh, Canonical have gone with the Intel um, EFI Linux um, loader, in that that one is, is already signed by the Microsoft key. Yes? Um. No. No. Okay. But binaries have to be signed. Sure. Um, so the we're going with FE Linux because it's license compatible with our understanding, and 
um, is small, easy to manipulate, doesn't have a lot of extra baggage to it. It just does one thing and does it well, which is it loads, it boot loads on EFI. Okay. Um, so that that's kind of the situation there. As far as getting it signed, that um, we do actually have uh, our first uh, binary back from Microsoft signed through that program um, on FE Linux bootable, provided you, you're booting out on a machine that has those keys. Um, so that's the sure. s state of play there. Um, I, so I do have um, running here, I don't know if anybody, I don't know how, how much anybody in the room has been actually poking around with EFI. Um, James Bottomley blogged about, and I mm. wound up on LWN, the OVMF kind of QMU virtualized, um, uh, it, it based on Tiano and um, lets you play around with, with UEFI in a, in a VM. Um, I can demo that running here if there's interest. Um, I actually, it's not a very polished demo, but I can show you basically what the, the menus look sure. like and things. So. And while I'm setting that up, You'll I'll let Steve continue yeah. talking about other things. Um, so in Debian, do we want to do secure boot? And I've seen a number of opinions saying that we should just not play. You know, expect all the end users to actually disable secure boot if they want to install Debian. Okay. Um, is that a viable option? Is it something we would want to do? So, um, microphone? I've, I've got the mic. Okay, Phil? Uh, right, the, uh, the idea of getting a Debian key in somewhere or getting a bootloader that trusts a whole bunch of distro keys, I think that's a real problem because we're meant to be allowing people downstream from us to uh, do what we do. That's the whole point of Debian, is that our derivatives get the same rights. So we've got a thing in the, we don't allow people to do licenses specifically to Debian for free software. And saying this key works, but you can't make up your own in your bedroom uh, is pretty much the same thing. So unless we can make it so that someone can download Debian, create their own key, using Debian software and somehow have it an equal class to the Debian key, I, I think will have failed. So th that's why we shouldn't be setting up a list of trusted keys. Okay. okay. Mike, down the front again. I mean, quick show of hands from the people here. Who thinks that we should do secure boot in some way and not just say no? What do you mean by secure Well, as in before everyone do. answers that, like, is it possible that in some cases we will have to implement secure boot or it wouldn't boot? Like, is it is it uh, a possibility that someday an OEM will not implement the disable secure boot thing? Yeah. Mm. So, like, I in it's famous that Microsoft doesn't you want microphone away a bit. I'm struggling okay. to hear you. Sorry. It, I, I read many, in many places that Microsoft will not allow OEMs to, to disable secure boot on ARM processors. So maybe we have no choice and we have to implement it. No? Over to B, Dale, please. Microsoft, in their Windows 8 logo requirements, say that on any x86-based machine, the OEM has to provide the switch to turn secure boot off. Yes. There is no requirement that that switch is easy to find or well-labeled or obvious in the BIOS configuration, but to meet the Windows 8 logo requirements as they are currently published, Microsoft requires that the hardware OEM provide a switch to disable secure boot. Their motivation for this is actually very interesting because, of course, Windows 8 is the first version of Windows that can work with secure boot. And so if you want manufacturers to continue producing hardware that can be used with older versions of Windows, you have to have a way to turn off secure boot. Yeah. And so, so one solution that we can have is that we tell all of our users, find the switch, turn off secure boot, and ignore it. But mm. the problem is if you turn that switch off and you have a dual boot machine and you want to use secure boot to boot Windows, then you've got that problem of the switch has to be one way for one and one for the other. 
Yeah. You've also got the situation where potentially, especially in bigger corporate environments, so, the standard is going to be that you will not be allowed to turn off secure boot. Unless this has changed, what I read is that that switch, it's mandatory, uh, Microsoft says it's mandatory. Go on, carry on please, quick. For a 386, but it shouldn't be there for ARM. For, for ARM, That's correct. yes, correct. So, in the case of ARM, we have to implement it. No choice, right? No, not at all. No, because Microsoft doesn't control the market of ARM hardware that comes out. Yeah. And the only requirement is that if you have a piece of ARM hardware that you want to put the Windows logo on, logo on yeah. then it has to comply with these, these criteria. But anybody who's making ARM devices that are not intended for, for, to ship with Windows on them, and there are many out there, it's not mm -hmm. an issue at all. The, it, the question is, it, it, the, the immediate effect is it makes a Windows phone much less interesting as a, a device you might want to purchase to hack on. Um, but it doesn't immediately mean that you can't get free ARM hardware to hack on. Yeah. So if I read you correctly, what happens when the market share of those old versions of Windows decreases to the point where they no longer need the Switch feature? Exactly. We will either have demonstrated that there's enough market share of non-Windows operating systems that the OEMs will naturally want to keep the switch available, or we will have all figured out how to make our operating systems boot when the switch is turned on, or we'll buy hardware from other vendors. Yeah. Right. Ian's had his hand up for about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> So this, this, this question of derivatives that um, Phil mentions is certainly very important, and it's a, a key thing that we've been trying to do in Debian forever. Another thing that we have been trying to do is provide convenient access to non-free stuff yeah. um, as a kind of sideline. And it seems to me that this might be a way out of this dilemma. Um, to treat signed, you know, to treat signed firmware, signed bootloader, whatever it is, that we have made with a key that we can't share with anybody as a non-free item. And if yeah, we do that, if then you do that, I've then got we can, we, you can use. Serve, we can we can, you know, that is the traditional compromise mm -hmm. that we have made um, to to try to support both users and derivatives as best we can. Sure. It, it, it's an option, but at that point, of course, our standard boot media will never work with Secure Boot. It's a, it's a compromise yet. Right. How's Steve getting on? Yeah, I can, I can run through a demo here. Basically, um, there's, there's just some hacky scripts around uh, QMU, KVM at the moment. Um, this is the script to launch uh, based on OVMF as the firmware. Um, let's see here if I can point at some. Oh, yeah. So basically, you pass it in a device, HDB, fat colon SB dash keys, which is it takes a directory that you have your firmware keys on that you want to load in um, and, and makes that show up as a, a fat file system to under QEMU. The dash L there tells it where to look for its BIOS and then points it at the current directory. Um, those are the key things there. The rest is just um, um, various switches to QEMU to do different things. Um, this has been uh, this is this is being cargo culted a bit from some other people that that I've been working with on this at the moment. Uh, let's see now. So there's that script. There's also a script to uh, there's a Python expect script which um, actually configuring a machine for secure you have to go through quite a bit of firmware. So the fact that we have a, a firmware that happens to back end onto effectively a serial console makes it nice to jam this in at runtime. Because apparently, I, I don't know if it's supposed to work or not, but um, saving the uh, uh, NVRAM variables so that they're persistent across boots doesn't seem to be working. I don't know why. I don't know if that's just not implemented in OVMF or whatever. So this is a script that I've, I've run each time um, on boot. So let me see here.
So yeah, um, the VM has been started um, and it's it's stopped, and that seems to actually be a bug of some kind in my setup, which I don't understand yet. Um, so actually, I will trigger it into running by throwing this init machine script at the TTY, um, which will cause it to start doing things. Um, and that's I'm running the script this time just to th give it input on the console so that it unstops, which I haven't figured out why that's necessary. But here you see it attempting to and then failing to um, actually find any uh, find anything to boot. So it's, it's dropped you to a, a firmware shell prompt, um, which is kind of DOS shell-like. Um, in this case, we're going to just do an exit. And you get this BIOS kind of configuration looking thing. Uh, pretty simple boot manager. It shows you the list of devices it can see, escape out of that. Boot maintenance manager, uh, boot options, whatnot. And the, the device manager is actually where the, the secure boot is configured. Um, so uh, rather than drilling down into this manually, although it, you know, it's various settings of, of different kinds of keys, I'm going to reset here and then run the script again, which is going to, using expect, is going to drive your firmware, which is kind of a funny thing to look at. Um, And there it goes. So now what we get, if we hit continue here, um, what that's done is it has loaded into the, oh, interesting that it failed. It's kind of, sometimes it likes me and sometimes it doesn't. Um, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we will walk the tree manually here. Um, FS0, file system 0, oops. Actually, the fact that it failed and didn't auto boot means I can show you what happens if you try. What I've done with that script is it has grabbed out of that directory the, the local test keys that I've generated for myself um, and loaded them into the keck and the DB and the, I think even the platform key so that um, those are the only keys that this instance of the firmware trusts. Um, so now if I try to run boot x64.efi, Oh, I picked the wrong one. So I don't actually get to show you the, the demo without having to reboot it again anyway. So this is actually the signed um, copy of FE Linux that's, that I've locally signed the binary with the same key that I also shoved into the firmware. Um, and so we've got an FE Linux that gives you a boot menu. Um, and this, this FE Linux does no uh, verification of kernels. This is, uh, it just has, a, it's been patched to have a menu which FE Linux upstream does not have. Um, and it, Wow, really demo syndrome today. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it's meant to go ahead and, and boot off of the, the disk okay. and everything. Right, we oh, are I know. very, I very close to out of time. Um, two questions. Okay. Right, fade on. However, go. And we don't have a mic. Joe, 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 turn around. <laughs> Yell it quickly. Go. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, you're right. I haven't been able to ask. I'm just a, bear with me, folks. Yes, you're right. You're saying that I haven't. T told you about the alternatives to boycotting C Secure Boot. I was hoping to get there, but we really have run out of time. This is, this is what, I'm, what I'm hoping to work out. Take the for the That's basically what I've just done. Um, I would like us to actually make the decision about, do we, go with, do we say no to Secure Boot? Do we do something like Ubuntu of go with um, in something that has been signed once that will then happily run whatever we tell it to. Do we go for something like Fedora where we end up having to sign everything down the chain? Do we do something else? Um, 
I'm hoping to, to work out with people here what we would like to do, but yeah, we've been sidetracked. Joe, microphone to... The difference between um, Ubuntu's and Fedora strategies seems to also be based on legal advice. Yes. So if we decide that we, if in the case that we decide we don't boycott Secure Boot, then before doing anything technical, we should get some legal advice, shouldn't we? It's, it's a Yes, we should probably get legal advice too. Um, this is going to be something that's going to have to come up. Right, here are the question over here first. No. So just as an aside here, I don't know that today we actually support booting in, in FE mode on the CDs on any hardware on, on x86. Right. So yeah. that's something that regardless of whether Debian decides mm -hmm. to implement secure boot, um, FE is the firmware of the future on PCs one way or the other. Yeah, um, absolutely. We're not going to have BIOS boot as an option on these machines once they come out. So even if, even if the plan is you have to disable secure boot, we've got to implement FE support in, uh, in, window, or, um, in, in Debian installer and Debian CD or whatever. And I'm yeah. being told the time's up. Okay, Ian is suggesting that we should, instead of calling it secure boot, be calling it restricted boot. That, yeah, by all means, feel free to do that. <laughs> I'm using the name that other people have given it. It's not our technology. It's their spin. Correct, it's their spin, yes. We don't have to buy into their spin. Agreed. Well, time's up today. Thank you for coming. I was... Please continue. There is some discussion already started about this on Debian Devel. We're gonna, we clearly have more and more to talk about about this, and, and not just talk, but actually start implementing things. I'm hoping to get EFI boot working at some level for Wheezy, even if we don't get secure boot or restricted boot or anything like it working. Um, we still have uh, basic work below that level to do yet. Um, thank you for coming, folks.